Good evening. Thank you very much, Marty, for the introduction. And good evening to everyone. I would like to start by sharing a story with you. It's a story that happened about 40 years ago, but I still remember it very vividly. I was about 21, and I had decided I was going to learn modern Greek. So I bought myself a textbook. I found myself a Greek friend, and I convinced her to give me tutorials so that I would learn Greek. About six months later, I decided to put it all into practice, and I decided to go to Greece to spend the summer with my friend's parents and uh, just to use my language. So here I was one evening with a group of friends by the beautiful Mediterranean Sea in northern Greece, in Thessaloniki. And we were watching the sunset. And suddenly, I felt chilly. And I thought to myself, I'm cold. And then I thought, how do I say that in Greek? So I remember in my head, juggling around with all the languages that I already knew, trying to find a translation for it that would work. I remembered in the textbook I had learned how to say cold, krio. And also in the textbook, I had learned how to say it's cold, kani krio. But lo and behold, there was nothing in the textbook to help me know how to say I'm cold. So I thought, well, maybe it's like in Spanish. Maybe it's, I have cold, tengo frío. Spanish and Greek have a lot of things in common, a similar way of packaging information and thinking about the world. So maybe that was a good guess. But then I thought, wait, what if it is like in English? I'm cold. Maybe there is something more general, more default, more universal about English and the way this thing is done in English. And then I thought, wait, maybe it could be like German. Es ist mir kalt. It's cold to me. Because after all, Greek and German share a case system, the nominative and the accusative, which neither English nor Spanish have. So just about when I was ready to just give up and say one thing at random and see what would happen, the friend who was sitting next to me turned his head and said, Crionis? I said, yes, I cold. Criono. Do you cold? Yes, I cold. <laughs> so at that moment, right there, right then, I learned how to say I'm cold in Greek. And I also understood that there is a fourth way to say it. Now, that evening, I wasn't going to be right. No matter what I had tried to say, I was going to be wrong. And my friend gave me the answer, right? But I was doing something very, very multilingual, a very multilingual thing, which is using all of the languages that I already knew to try to learn the new language better. So here I am 40 years later, and I have developed a very big interest in multilingualism. And that's why I wanted to talk about teaching in the classroom and thinking multilingually. And my contention is that we language teachers are in the business of educating multilinguals. Think about it. All your students are multilingual. Either they're multilingual already, or they are multilinguals in the making. You're making them multilingual by teaching them a new language. Right? So we can't teach well if we do not think multilingually. I want to convince all of you, if you're not convinced already, that we must uh, think multilingually in the foreign language classroom. So what do we know about multilinguals? One thing we know is that they use all their multilingual experiences, all their knowledge of other languages to learn the target language better, just like I did in Greece that day. 
We also know that the multilingual brain cannot shut on and off the languages at will. Even when using only one language, in listening, in reading, in speaking, all the languages of the multilingual are lit up, are activated in the brain. This is what psycholinguists call language activation, cross-language activation. So in other words, I'm speaking in English right now to you, and yet my brain is all lit up. The Greek, the German, the Spanish are also working. And all of you, I imagine, are multilinguals. You're listening to my English, you're processing my English, and yet your brains cannot help it. Your brains are multilingual and they are lit up with all your languages. Right. So multilingualism is a tool that multilinguals use to be very metalinguistically aware, to learn language better. Multilingualism is also a tool that the brain cannot shut off and on. It's a tool that is always on in the brain. But multilingualism is also a value, a worldview. So we know that multilinguals are different from monolinguals. And we also know that some multilinguals are confident. They leave their multilingualism harmoniously, stress-free. And other multilinguals, many other multilinguals, suffer from linguistic insecurity. They leave their multilingualism conflictively. So let me talk first about the confident multilinguals. One case of that is Judith. Uh, Judith is from Hungary and she's in her late 20s and she lives in Finland. And her Finnish is very good. She's been there already for five years, so she speaks very fluently. But she tells that when speaking to friends in Finnish, she likes translating some idioms literally from her mother tongue Hungarian into Finnish. So like for example, to say that someone is good hearted, in Hungarian we can say that someone can spread on bread. It's very similar to Spanish, where I grew up in southern Spain, we can say that someone is un pedazo de pan. Right? A piece of bread, a chunk of bread, a bite of bread, if they're very good hearted. So Judith does this all the time with her friends. She's speaking very good Finnish and suddenly she translates literally these idioms and then she admits that her friends get pretty startled and they say, what are you saying? What, what, what do you mean? Why do you say that? But she says that she explains it to them, that I'm saying this, this is a saying that we say in Hungary. Yeah? And she insists that that's not a mistake. She's not wrong because she's doing it purposefully and on purpose and because she's explained to her friends what the saying means and what the idiom means. In fact, she says that she enjoys using language a little bit differently and having people get used to it. <laughs> so she's like nudging her friends to be a little bit more multilingual, even without learning a new language like Hungarian. Right? But not all multilinguals are confident like Judith. We have many, many multilinguals in this country, for example, who suffer from linguistic insecurity. Let me ju just give you an example. Um, students from the US studying Mandarin and going abroad to China to practice their language. Depending on how they look, they have very different experiences. Those who are Asian Americans, they look Asian. They get constantly criticized by the locals when they try to use their Mandarin. They're asked, how come don't you speak better Chinese? Why is your Chinese so poor? And then they have to explain, well, you know, I may look Asian, but I'm Asian American. Those students, the same groups of students from the US, when they look white, they look stereotypically, prototypical American, they get compliments on their Mandarin. They're regularly praised and admired and celebrated for speaking whatever Mandarin they can speak. 
So after a lifetime of receiving these criticisms, um, it is no miracle that then linguistic inse insecurity happens. Yeah? Think of how many speakers in the United States who come to our classes are told, have been told for a lifetime that they don't speak well enough their languages or that they speak in Spanglish and if you want to, take, uh, to be taken seriously, you need to start speaking better, learn proper Spanish or proper Arabic or proper um, Persian. So we have both kinds of multilinguals in our classrooms as students. We have the confident ones, we have the ones who suffer linguistic insecurity. What are we going to do about them? Are we going to think monolingually with them or by multilingually with them? But there is one more fact that we should not forget, and this is that the world is massively multilingual. How many languages do we have in the world, human languages? 7,000, give or take, at least catalogued ones, right? And how many nation states, how many countries? Almost 200. So 7,000 languages for 200 countries. Do the math. No, really, do the math. <laughs> I have done the math. And it's actually an average of 35, more or less 35 uh, languages per country. Right? But some countries are much more multilingual than that. Think of Mexico, our neighbor. Right? When we think of Mexico, we think of Spanish. And when we have students from Mexico in our classrooms or Mexican-Americans, we just think of Spanish and English, right? But the government, so the Mexican government, recognizes 68 indigenous languages. And linguists actually think there are about 282 indigenous languages in Mexico alone. Right? And to that we have to add immigrant languages. Yes, Mexico also has immigrants. It's about one million immigrants, and actually most of them are from the United States. So they speak English. But there are also a sizable uh, number of immigrants from Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, and some of them still speak Arabic. Imagine that. How often do we think of Mexicans as fluent Arabic Spanish speakers? Tacos al pastor? We can order it in every restaurant. Tacos al pastor is a contribution from Lebanese cuisine to Mexican cuisine. Right? So the food can be multilingual, the country can be multilingual, and we may not ever notice it. Even here in the United States, massively multilingual. We think of our country as monolingual, but it's monolingual only in ideology. Not a day passes by that I don't hear other languages that are not English around me here in Washington, D.C., where I live. In fact, I live in the neighborhood of Georgetown, which is, believe me, not particularly linguistically or ethnically diverse. And yet I constantly hear other languages around me. Just my new dentist. I was surprised and delighted that the hygienists all speak Spanish among themselves at work when talking about work. Or my hairdresser. It's a family business and they are trilingual in Italian, Spanish and English. The clientele too, everyone comes in and out, speaking one or more of those languages. And of course we have, take an Uber or a Lyft, almost every driver has an accent, which means they are multilingual, right? And there are so many other invisible multilinguals, like janitors, uh, building repair people on my campus in this hotel. Many of them speak Spanish, Amharic or other languages, they are multilinguals. So if we have multilingualism everywhere in the world, 
if we have multilingualism in our students, some confident, some suffering from linguistic insecurity, what are, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to teach trying to make the classroom into an island of monolingualism? It's just not going to work. So I'm almost done with my talk. And at this point is when many of you are thinking, well, that's all very nice, but how can we use these multilingual insights for our own teaching? I would say, first of all, there are many innovative educators who are already doing it. And I would encourage all language teachers to talk to colleagues, colleagues who teach their own language and colleagues who te teach other languages. Ask them, do you think monolingually or bilingually, multilingually with your students? But let me give you a few examples of how this could be done. And it runs the whole gamut from small gestures to well-designed activities to very complex cross-course and curricular types of design. The small gestures, they're designed to make everyone's multilingualism in the, in the class shine and to be a reminder that the world is multilingual. These are things that teachers can do on the fly. So for, for example, uh, Thanksgiving is approaching. So before you launch into a lesson about guajalote and pavo and chunte in different varieties of Spanish, you could start by asking your students, how many, how many words do you know for turkey? And then just let them tell the words, sound out the words before then doing the lesson that you had planned. Or are you the kind of teacher who puts up labels on your walls in your classroom with useful, useful uh, words, phrases, sentences? Why not put up labels in several languages, not just the target language? And you don't need to speak those languages or know those languages. You can just ask your students to create those labels in the languages that they know. Examples of well-designed activities. Well, how many of us do research papers? The students, we ask them to do research papers um, on cultural topics of their choice. Why not give them extra credit if when they do the research at home, if they identify, locate, and use academic references in more than just the target language? more than the target language and English. Any languages that they can read. Give them extra credit. And then during homework, during the research, they would be acting multilingually. And in the end, they would write the paper in the target language. How about cross-course, large-scale curriculum design? One thing that is coming up a lot in many universities is cognate language courses. At Georgetown, in my university, we have developed now a whole suite of courses. Uh, we named them all uh, 009 courses that are designed for people who already know a language. And then the pedagogy is multilingual and very specific to make them uh, go through the material much, much faster than in the regular courses. So Spanish for French speakers, French for Spanish speakers, Practically all the Romance languages now have a, an 009 course. But we also have a, an, an 009 for Persian for Arabic speakers. Not because Persian and Arabic are related, which they're not, but because the writing systems are very related. And so students who already know Arabic have a head start with Persian. So that's a really good example of how to think multilingually at the curricular level. Again, is it realistic to do this when we have just three to five hours with our students in the foreign language classroom? I think it is. I think there are ways of doing it. I just gave you some very few examples. And as I say, you can talk to other uh, educators and share and observe. 
But if we know that the world is massively multilingual, if we know that we have multilinguals who are confident and multilinguals who are um, plagued by linguistic insecurity, we can't turn our back to the multilingualism that is the reality of what we do. Right? We are educators, and our job is to educate multilinguals. There is no way to avoid multilingualism as a tool and multilingualism as a value. Not without wasting the benefits of knowing many things about language and about languages as we learn the new language. Not without quenching the confident multilinguals and their playfulness. Not without adding to the linguistic insecurity of the multilinguals who all their lives have been told their ways of speaking and the ways of speaking of their families and their communities are not good enough. So for all those reasons, that's why I say teachers must think multilingually. Thank you.